Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we're really pleased to be holding this event. So I'll just introduce myself. I'm Huda Amori, a co-founder of Palestine Action. And this event is, as you know, on how Albert Systems tests weapons on Palestinians. For most of you, you'll probably know Albert Systems is the primary target of Palestine Action's Dallas Action campaign, and one that we've been hitting hard for quite some for quite some years. And we're really pleased to have Anthony Lowenstein joining us from Sydney, Australia. And um, he came out with a book on the Palestine Laboratory, how Israel exports the technology of occupation around the world, which is a very uh, fitting topic, especially in the context of the current genocide. It was a best-selling uh, book, and we actually wanted to do this event for quite some time, but I think um, it's not been a more uh, suitable moment to have this conversation. He's also an independent freelance investigative journalist and a filmmaker and the co-founder of Declassified Australia, and we're really honoured to have you and to learn yeah. uh, from 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 your research and what you have uh, written about and your expertise. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Okay, so just to begin, would you can mm. you tell us a bit about what got you? I mean, I'm yeah, quite a big uh, answer, but what got you involved with Palestine and what yeah. brought you in into this um, into the wider movement? So yeah, the, look the best the short way to say I was I'm born I'm from Australia I'm Jewish I was brought up in a pretty traditional not conservative but traditional Jewish home which generally meant in the past and I think I fear too much still today to support Israel it wasn't you know beaten into me but the idea of supporting Israel was seen as a pretty normal thing to do because of my background because of most of my family were killed in the Holocaust it was seen as logical to support Israel and. As years went on until when I got into my teens, I started feeling, I mean, I think now if I look back, I don't think I ever had met a Palestinian until my 20s. It's not like they were physically kept from me, but it was just very unusual to meet a Palestinian, which in hindsight is something that I'm ashamed of. Not that I was, you know, consciously not meeting someone, but it just wasn't in my world. And over years, I started getting disillusioned with what I saw in the Jewish community. I grew up in Melbourne in Australia. Melbourne has got one of the highest percentage of Holocaust survivors in the world. And I think that massively impacted in the past and still now to an extent how a lot of people view Israel and the supposed need for a Jewish state. And as I, get, as I got older... I massively rejected that. I became far more conscious of what Israel was doing, what was being done in my name, what was being said in the Jewish community on behalf of me, what was expected of me as someone Jewish. I was never that religious. Um, I first went to Palestine in 2005 for the first time. I was working on a book called My Israel Question, which came out in 2006, which was a critical look of Israel. Palestine and also the role of the Israel lobby in various countries, your country, the US and Australia and elsewhere. And the response to that book, which in hindsight, believe me, was pretty mild, was just apoplexy. The Jewish community lost its shit. Um, you know, the, I was condemned in parliament, just craziness. And I guess in the last 20 years, a lot of my work has not just been about Palestine. It's been about the war in Afghanistan, the war on terror, the war on drugs. And But I kept on coming back to Palestine. I've been visiting there um, for 20 years, Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. I started visiting Gaza in 2009. And then in 2016 to 2020, I lived there with my partner. She was working for an international aid organization, and I was doing freelance journalism. And that's when the genesis of this book began. And, yeah, I've been writing about it for a long time. And... Yeah, I feel like it's in my blood, for better or worse. Brilliant. For better, for better, <laughs> for yeah. better, for better. But obviously it's, yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not choosing a light subject. None of us are really, but here we are. Yeah, no, it's in it's in my blood as well. Um, yes. The, the Palestinian and Iraqi blood inside of me. Indeed. Um, so one of the, so obviously you've seen kind of what we've been doing a bit in England. Mm. We have quite a few Israeli weapons factories. 
more mm -hmm. so we have the main target of ours is Albert Systems because they have mm -hmm. a lot more factories. Um, then, but we also have Raphael, which I believe is a government-owned Israeli weapons company who are in Newcastle, up north in England. Uh, that's yeah. that relatively recent development, actually, in the past couple of years. When you look at when these uh, these companies were founded, both Israeli weapons companies, Raphael was founded in 1948, obviously coincides with the, the Nakba, and Elbert Systems was founded in 1966. Yeah. Um, my own family, um, my, my father, when he was a child, he was forced out of his home um, by the Israeli military who were shooting bullets into the windows of their home at the time, as were many others, during uh, 1967. So I was just wondering if you could maybe explain a bit more about the significance of these companies being founded around that time and what that um, what that meant mm. for the Israeli arms industry, but also the Palestinians. Look, one of the things that came out very clearly in my book is that pretty much from the beginning, 48, the Nakba, of course, but also the establishment of Israel, Israeli leaders saw the need, in their view, for an, in, an arms industry, uh, the need to basically to make friends. I mean, I would say transactional friendships. And this was beginning in the 50s, although the late 40s, but especially the 50s. The first major arms deal was in the 50s with then West Germany, obviously only a few years after the Holocaust, which is a very contentious deal. It really accelerated, though, in the 60s, particularly and it coincided with the 67 war, the beginning of the occupation, obviously the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. And it was there was a realisation, I have these in the book, there was a realisation among some in the Israeli diplomatic and military corps that putting aside the ideologues who obviously believed that it was their God-given right to settle the land, putting those people aside for a minute, there was an awareness that a lot of the world didn't like what Israel was doing. They saw it as colonialism. They saw it as an occupation. They wanted Israel to give back the land. And they saw, though, the arms industry, not just selling weapons, but also training and advice as something that they could leverage to make friends. And as I show in the book, there is this unbelievable acceleration from the late 60s pretty much to this day. So 50, what is that, 56, seven years of partnering with pretty much, if you think of, and this is probably also why I wrote the book, we know a lot about the role of the US post-World War II, partnering, supporting, arming, training the worst regimes on the planet. What's far less known is Israel was often right by their side, not to every country, but in many, many cases. So I'm talking about Pinochet's Chile from 73. I'm talking about apartheid South Africa right till the end, till 94. Uh, the regime in Guatemala that was committing genocide in the 80s, the Iranians before 79, in fact, obviously after 79 as well. I mean, there are so many examples. And so Israel was partly making money, but it wasn't just money. It wasn't just, yes, the company Elwood and others were making profits, sure. But in some cases, it was, it was financial, but some cases it was also ideological. So with South Africa during apartheid, yes, there was a massive... Uh, arms deal, arms deals that were going on between the two countries, but it was more than that. Both countries in that case saw the other as fighting a, a war of freedom against what they regarded as barbarism, blacks in South Africa, Palestinians in Palestine. And you see through these documents I have in the book that both countries saw that their war was a noble war against the enemy, that it was, you know, it was basically us against everybody else. So one of the things that became very clear, let's finish on this point, was that, again, it started in the late 40s, but especially after 67, there was this sense that Israel and Israeli generals and trainers and advisors would go around the world openly talking about how they were testing techniques and weapons on Palestinians. It wasn't particularly hidden. I'm not saying it was always put on the front page of the New York Times, but it was it was something that many other countries found appealing, even nations that publicly opposed the occupation. So you look at the list of countries that partnered with Israel, particularly six, since 67, and the list is unbelievably long. Even some countries that were vocally saying the occupation is terrible. And the reason I mentioned that is finally, finally, is that 
I'm really conscious of the fact that there have been a lot of nations that have said they oppose a genocide in Gaza, which is good, but history would suggest that some of those nations will be very keen, despite what's happened since October 7, to still potentially buy Israeli weapons, many of which are being tested in Gaza as we speak. Yes, definitely. When you when you realise the links, the hypocrisy is very clear. Unbelievable. And also, we've all got short-term memory loss. Memory. Or, yes, or, everything goes down the memory hole, sadly. Memory yeah, more likely it's, it's very deliberate propaganda. Yes. One of the things Elbert is known for is supplying 85% of uh, Israel's military drone fleet. We see drones constantly being used in Gaza, and, but increasingly yeah. now in the West Bank as well. Uh, can you explain a bit about um, Elbert's role with the drone fleet and why Israel mm. and the Israeli arms trade has become infamous, basically, for, for its supply of drones? Yeah, I mean, drones obviously have been used by a long time. There are even an early drone use in the Vietnam War. That was obviously by the Americans, not the Israelis. But where, where Israel really started massively using drones was in the Lebanon War in the early 80s. Obviously, an early iteration, not that sophisticated. And to the point where you have the US CIA, I have this in the book, writing memos internally, which have since been declassified, saying how they really think that Israel's pioneering this important technology and they worry that it's going to go into the wrong hands. Wrong hands meaning enemies of the US and Israel. This is what they worried at the time. So Israel, with an act, with a a, a captive population in Palestine, along with, of course, massive drone use over Lebanon. I mean, obviously, Israel occupied parts of Lebanon till, 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 until 2000. And anyone who lives in Beirut or elsewhere will regularly say that there's constant illegal uh, Israeli fighter jets and drones being used over Lebanon. I'm talking about since, since 2000, the last 24 years. So Israel really has a massive... I guess, population to uh, test and trial these. And of course, in the last 10 or 15 years, Israel's become one of the top three or four biggest exporters of drones to the world. So countless other countries are using Israeli drones, democracies and dictatorships. And Elbert has been a key part of that. And it's finally on this point, one thing I look at in the book um, is the European Union has been using Elbert drones over the Mediterranean. Now, these are unarmed. And as Europe has made a decision, when I say Europe, I guess the EU, the bureaucracy, et cetera, since 2015, after the 1 million or so refugees came from mostly Middle East and Africa, this establishment of so-called Fortress Europe, which is an attempt to obviously keep brown and black people out of Europe as much as possible, Israeli drones that have been battle-tested in Gaza, over Gaza since 2008-9, are now in active use by the EU 24-7, monitoring the Mediterranean, making decisions in a way who might get rescued and who might not. And as we know, the EU has made a decision to pretty much let most people drown. That's not officially their policy, but that's the in practice reality. We don't have many rescue boats anymore. So the Israeli drones are a key part of that infrastructure. Again, drones that have been tested over Gaza on Palestinians. Yeah, and, and here we have the uh, UK government bought the Watchkeeper drones, which has been it's been going on the contract for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and it's, and the, the use is very similar. It's to use it over the English Channel against uh, yes. my speaking refuge. Yes. yes. And there's you know, an exact copy of the Hermes 450, which is being used, mm. in, used in Gaza. Um, there, so... Over here in, in, in England recently, well, it's been going on quite a few months, there was first some talk of legal advice saying to the UK government that it's um, illegal to continue arms sales to Israel. They refused to publish this legal advice, but we've had a lot of discussions and rumours, uh, none of which have confirmed to be true, that there will be some arms restrictions um, on sending arms to Israel. But can you explain a bit about why that is not enough to deter this genocide industry and the full picture of the Israeli arms trade with the UK, but also also globally? 
Yes. I mean, obviously, I would support the idea of the UK not selling any weapons to Israel, to be clear. Of course, I do. But it's important to note that the percentage of the Israeli arms that they're using in Gaza coming from the UK is relatively small. The US, of course, is the biggest provider by far. Germany is number two. Without, I mean, the US is obviously the key player, has been for years. But I think what Britain provides in some ways, obviously, with Britain's history towards Israel towards Zionism and the ongoing deference that successive British governments have had towards Israel, whether it's the Tories for the last, what, 12 years, and obviously Labour's been in power for one month. I know it's early days, but it's pretty clear that my, my fear is that if the UK does announce that, it'll be tinkering at the edges. That there'll be, I mean, the, because then I, go, I know we'll discuss this later, hopefully, but Ultimately, what will stop or massively reduce Israel's ability to fight, inverted commas, in Gaza and commit massacres is not just the weapons. Obviously, the weapons are important. They're what they use, what they fire on Palestinians 24-7. But it's more than that. It's a legitimacy that Western states are granting Israel to operate. And after 10-plus months and what, 40, 50,000 Palestinians killed, possibly more, the majority of whom, of course, are civilians in Gaza, let alone what's happening in the West Bank, which, by the way, is increasingly, Israel is massively ramping up violence, there's increasing use of drone warfare, huge amounts of Palestinians have been killed, not as many as in Gaza, but huge amounts, that without some kind of formal arms embargo i'm talking about the reducing the ability of israel to be able to sell its own weapons from the uk's perspective what they're selling into israel is not insignificant but it's relatively small but the fact that israel is still able to sell unimpeded globally this is one final fact we have the figures from 2023 the latest amount of the israeli arms industry what they export and the amount last year was the biggest ever, 13.1 billion US dollars. The highest, as I said, on record, those weapons were going to, well, a range of places. India is the biggest buyer, but there are many other countries across Europe, certainly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Many, many European states went to Israel almost begging for some kind of missile defense shields, et cetera, to protect them of what they thought, rightly or wrongly, was the potential of Russian invasion or attack by, by Putin. So to me, in your part of the world, being Europe and, and England, there is a real possibility, I think, of putting massive pressure on Israel through not just diplomatic pressure, but I think also imposing some kind of military embargo. If you cut off the ability to sell weapons, Israel won't collapse the next day. They won't. But it is massively powerful. It's a huge impetus. This industry is soaring. And even since October 7, as I've been doing some work on this issue, there's been an awareness within Israel as, it, as its economy has taken a hit, it's been at war for 10 plus months, that the arms industry and the cyber tech industry, including surveillance, phone hacking, etc., is a huge growth area because many, many countries want to get a piece of that action. And if Israel is reduced in being able to sell or promote that, then it's going to have a huge impact on them economically. Can you give some, um, you talked there about the spyware and mm. other surveillance and weapons. Is there other concrete examples you can elaborate on, on technologies that start off by being developed through the occupation and then are used across the world? Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of people listening to this will be aware of Pegasus. Pegasus is probably the most infamous, which is, for those who don't know briefly, Pegasus is a tool that is used remotely to a, 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 a government, an intelligence service, an army, it could be private actors, can essentially take all the information from your phone without you knowing literally everything it can uh, you know text messages photos emails etc it can turn on your phone and camera without you realizing even when it's switched off by the way 
And there are many, many other tools. Pegasus is the most well-known. It's been used against, we don't even know how many countries, to be honest. Um, I always think in the sort of 80, 90 nations have bought Pegasus. I've got, I, as far as I'm aware, England has is not using Pegasus. I'm happy to be corrected. But they may well be using other forms. Celebrite, for example, is a well-known Israeli company, which um, does, I mean, it's a form of phone hacking, essentially. It requires the police. I know it's used in your country. It's used in my country, too, where a phone's passcode can be broken, essentially. So an activist, a journalist, a so-called terrorist, whoever, they won't give you the password to your iPhone. And in theory, it's impossible to crack. And Celebrite allows you to do that. And that's sold to countless countries around the world, democracy, so to speak, and repressive states from Russia to China, et cetera. And Israel's probably per capita the number one surveillance exporter in the world. Obviously, Israel's a relatively small country, but in terms of the influence of that and much of that technology is coming from individuals who have spent their years working in Israeli intelligence. Unit 8200, which is a set of Israel's intelligence arm, like the US's um, NSA, and their job every day is to monitor and track Palestinians. They take their experience into the private sector to, to build things like Pegasus and other tools. And despite all the controversy in the last four or five years since all the scandals around Pegasus, there is still no regulation anywhere, zero. In Europe, Europe is talking about it, flirting with it, openly discussing it, but nothing has happened. And I always say the reason is that so far, at least, no government wants to give up the power of these tools. They're totally addictive. So many governments, want to, they love the idea of going after, I mean, they, they don't say this, of course, but this is the reality, going after their enemies their journalists they don't like, the activists who are against them, their political opponents. This is how it's used. So, yeah. Yeah, we've had, um, so the police over here use Celebrite, as you said, okay. quite popular. And um, I had, we had a, I was stopped once by the police and several months later, I got the phone back uh, with a Celebrite sticker on the back of it. Just to come well, um, you know, um, they didn't actually manage to get into it, so so that was lucky. But okay. this is where they are sending the stuff that they take away from activists and other mm. people. Mm. Is being they're using Israeli technology to try and to try and hack into it. Um, so you know, it really is it really is everywhere, especially when it comes yes. to surveillance and 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 your privacy. Can you just explain a bit more about how that? Um, the surveillance of the spyware is used against Palestinians, how that mm. how it was developed in the first place. Yeah, so a lot of the surveillance I just mentioned is, uh, or two ways. One, the individuals who are behind it have spent years finding ways to monitor and track Palestinians. So Palestinians, phone calls, emails, any form of communication is monitored in Palestine, I'm talking about. One thing that came out with the Edward Snowden revelations in 2013 you know, the former NSA whistleblower now living in Russia he was astounded and he talked about this about how much the US government was assisting the monitoring of Palestinians in the US and globally for Israel now there's every indication that would also be the happening in the UK or Australia or elsewhere these are people by the way have no connection with terrorism I mean they're just Palestinians living in you know, New York, Washington, whatever, London, Sydney. And he's talked a lot about that, Snowden, and it's if people don't know about that, it's worth looking back into it. And there's no indication that it's changed. Now, obviously, his revelations came out 10 years ago, but no indication why that's changed. There's a lot of evidence that Pegasus and other tools are used against Palestinian civil society, Palestinian civil rights organizations in Palestine including ones that are gathering information on war crimes and crimes against humanity, some of which has been passed on to the International Criminal Court and the ICJ. This is long before October 7, by the way, but also since. And, I mean, any Palestinian, I mean, these people know this, people would know this on this conversation, but 
any Palestinian you speak to in Palestine operates under the presumption that their communication is probably monitored. Now, I don't think there's an Israeli listen, you know, I don't think there's someone in Tel Aviv listening to every single conversation of every single Palestinian all the time. It doesn't work that way. It's like, you know, all the every single American is being monitored, but it's not necessarily being listened to 24-7. What it does do though is it records that information and uses that often for blackmail. And I document that a lot in the book. That people want to get a visa to leave the country. They want to get medical care for their kid, for themselves. This is, this is both in Gaza, but also elsewhere. Um, many gay Palestinians often are blackmailed. I mean, there's a long history of this. It's horrific. And the technology which is being used is a combination of old-fashioned listening into phone calls and spyware. So all this technology which we are reading about operating in Hungary, Italy, uh, India, the list goes on and on and on, is usually first tested and trialled on Palestinians in Palestine first. So over here, um, Elbit, the first, so after Palestine Action launched, and there were actions against Elbit before Palestine Action, but when Palestine Action launched, it was a lot more sustained and disruptive. When for the first two years they had a strategy of no comment, they would never comment to the press about anything. And actually, I think it was around the time the Ukraine war started. Then they started, you know, getting a bit more cocky and started commenting to the press, saying that it's a time of global insecurity and how you know reckless we were. But another key thing they've been doing, uh, the uh, a strategy they've been trying to deploy, is that they deny association with Israel. And yeah. uh, it's quite hard to wrap your head around when you have an Israeli weapons maker. Uh, my barrister is to put it in our trial. You have Elbit trying to dissociate from, even Elbit wants to dissociate from Elbit. Um, and so they're clearly, their strategy is to try and say, well, we're Elbit UK. And even though we're completely owned by Elbit Israel and we're all part of the same company, et cetera, et cetera, we are different. So you can't yeah. put that on us and... You know, so it's a lot of it's a lot of as people have called it, um, corporate corporate gaslighting going on. Um, can you do you have any thoughts about why that could be? Yeah, I mean, I think there is an awareness by when I say the smarter Israeli weapons companies. I don't mean smart in terms of genius. I mean awareness of. Look, public opinion, this again, before October 7, but certainly since, there is growing public opposition to Israel. I mean, that is, that's not my opinion. That's based on public opinion polls for years. And the image of Israeli arms companies, Israeli state, particularly between the ages of 18 to 35, younger Brits and others, is low and that's massively increased since October 7 as in increased that that unpopularity has increased I remember a few months ago there was a poll in the UK which found the majority of Britons wanted a uh, ceasefire in Gaza I remember there was also a study which I'm sure people on this call would know calling for the UK to stop selling weapons to Israel which they didn't do but the, the views are there there is this growing disconnect I think between the political elites in your country and most countries that not entirely, but fairly uncritically support Israel, go to Israel on free lobby trips from the Israel lobby, come back praising how amazing Israel is, how awful Palestinians are, and the general public who don't want that. And, I mean, that strategy from Elbert UK is bizarre and nonsensical and should be laughed out of court. I mean, it's just it's weird. There's no basis in fact. And... I can only think that they hope that some stupid people in the press will buy it, but it's hard to see how they would. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, that's my guess that there's a growing awareness that public opinion is shifting against Israel. And that's been clear now for a good five to seven years. And it's hugely increased since October 7. Yes, unfortunately, um, it's some people, I think, just run with whatever official line they're given by the yeah. manufacturers and and don't challenge it. Um, 
but it is it is interesting to say the least that they have deployed this strategy more and more and also i guess just circling back a bit to what we were talking about the arms restrictions to israel which of course any restrictions would be welcome but one thing we see here as well is how elbit abused the export license um applications and process by one trying to make it as difficult as possible for us to get the full picture of their export licenses to Israel. And we do have evidence that they are exporting to Israel um, directly. But what they also do a lot of is send to Elbit companies in Israel rather than send it directly to the Israeli military so they can deny knowing how the products are used you know, and, and yeah. the final destination is, and you can imagine that any partial arms restrictions to Israel will allow them to continue using this. Yes. These types of loopholes. But obviously, as you said, it doesn't account for the fact that, you know, the huge industry of buying these weapons, which are first tested on Palestine. Mm. Mm. Oh, go on, go on. No, 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 you go on, you go on. Adrian. So the, they had a recent AGM, and uh, thankfully they translated it into English and put it on YouTube. And it was posted in March. And this is them in Israel. It's the CEO the um, talking to his investors. And it's very interesting because them and Albert Israel are very much more open to how connected they are to the Israeli military and to mm. the situation in Gaza and how every... You know, Elbil is one big family, basically, across the world. They're very open about saying that, completely different to to um, to their stance from Elbit UK. They had on it a, a video, um, and this was played during their last AGM. Um, I just wanted to play it for you and for the audience mm -hmm. and get your, get your reaction to it. Oh, um, um, it might be difficult. Can you see that? I can. Okay. Okay. אנחנו מרגישים שאנחנו חיילים על אזרחי, כי זאת התרומה שלנו ללחימה. אנחנו מספקים תוצרים וזמנים מדהימים. הרבה יכולות מבצעיות נוספות שלא היו בו. והאתגר הוא באמת לעמוד בקצבים שצה"ל משתמש, ושלא אנחנו נעצור את האפקטיביות של צה"ל. אני מקבל אינסוף מצה"ל וחיזוקים, ואנחנו שותפים בהרבה מאוד תחקירים תוך כדי לחימה שמראים איך המערכות שלנו מצילות חיים ומסייעות להכרעת המערכה הזאת. העובדים שיצאו לצו שמונה מקבלים את המוצרים שלנו, זה מקפיץ את המוטיבציה, בטירוף. זה גאווה גדולה להיות במקום הזה, גם לראות את האנשים שלנו שנלחמים ועובדים, גם לראות את המערכות שלנו. באמת מפת ההפעלה של התמרון הרב זרועי של צה"ל, יש לנו פה התחייבויות, יש לנו מחויבות ללקוח שלנו, לשדר מול העולם את החוסן הארגוני שלנו, להראות שאנחנו מצליחים לעמוד בקצבים, להמשיך לעמוד בספקות. וזה מה שמחבר אותנו כקבוצה כאירופה. בסוף אנחנו מגינים על המדינה, והתחושה היא תחושה של גאווה, תחושה שאני חוזר הביתה, אני גאה להגיד שאני עובד של אלביץ. אני רוצה לברך את כל העובדים ולהודות לכם על ההירתמות הבלתי רגילה לאורך כל השנה, במיוחד במלחמה הזאת. חלק מכם עובדים 24-7, מגיעים במשמרות לילה, מגיעים בשבתות, מה שאתם עושים. Would you like me to comment on that or <laughs> yeah well there's a few things about that that come to mind the first thing is that I'm sure people here know this that um the last speaker Yoav Gallant is wanted by the International Criminal Court for alleged war crimes in Gaza so that's one minor detail worth saying look it really goes to the heart of so much of what I see looking into the Israeli arms industry that it's framed so often not simply as making money which obviously it is it's a patriotic duty working for Elbert is seen I mean it's said openly that you are helping the state defend itself so they claim 
I don't think I don't think they actually mentioned the word Hamas, but obviously they're talking about the war in Gaza. Um, and I think this also goes to the heart of Israel itself is a one of the most militarized societies in the Western world. That obviously, yes, most people serve in the army, men and women. Um, obviously, some who don't, but particularly ultra orthodox men, but the majority of people do. I'm talking about people, Jews, not talking about Palestinians, of course. Or, and Elbert really frames itself, not just in Israel, but globally, as an essential part of not just the Israeli war machine, but the Israeli state. Because so much of what Israel relies on and has for decades is an image so on the one hand, it, it, it claims to be a thriving, beautiful democracy for all its citizens, which of course is bullshit, but that's what they say. On the other hand, it's the kind of country that if you screw with us, we're going to kill you. So it's almost like they're trying to portray both both images. And I remember there's a tweet that comes to mind from a few weeks ago, which is worth recalling here, that everyone here remembers that a few weeks ago, Israel killed one of the Hamas leaders in Tehran the day after they killed a senior Hezbollah leader in Lebanon. And Ilon Levy, who's this very weird British guy, also an Israeli, who was this spokesperson for the Israeli government before he was fired. It's a long, bizarre story. Anyway, he tweeted something, and the words were, and I'm paraphrasing here, not your grandparents' Jews anymore. Now, what he meant by that is a very interesting point which goes to the heart of what this industry is about. It's basically, to me, implying the Jews during the Holocaust were lambs to the slaughter. This is what is openly said by early Zionists when Israel was founded, often Holocaust survivors. Holocaust survivors were criticised for not putting up more of a fight against the Germans. That was the argument. Now, you fast forward 80-odd years and now there is this celebration, this um, belief that we as Israel have an amazing arms industry. We can kill anyone we want anywhere. But the great irony, and I say this as someone Jewish, is none of this is bring them security. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the exact opposite of that, that you can have all the weapons in the world. And yes, you have a very sophisticated army. All that's true, but it's not bringing you safety or security. So I see that video, I know it's a long explanation, but I see that video as part of all that, in a way. And for a lot of Israelis, at least, and many Jews around the world, they watch that video with pride. It's interesting how, you know, um, you can see that video and it just completely fills you with, with rage and also disbelief to the point where, you, you know, you can smile and laugh at it because it's so... Um, yeah. shocking about how someone else can watch that you know Zionists can watch Absolutely. that and be proud be proud of it and actually sometimes their propaganda is what you need to show the world the rest of the world just to show how how dystopian the situation yes really is and the um and the people behind making uh, making these weapons um and I talked there about patriotic Zionism could you just talk mm. a bit about how you know how the basis of having Palestine as a laboratory is built on the idea of racial supremacy? Yeah, well, obviously from day one, I mean, Israel was a Jewish supremacist state. I mean, that was in the whole ideology of, I would argue, from Zionism from day one. And I mean, really, if you look at early Zionist writing before Israel was even founded from the late um, 1900s, sorry, 1800s. It was very clear that Arabs were not seen as equal to Jews. Again, this is 40 years before Israel was even a state after World War II. And the whole racial supremacy aspect of, of Zionism is central because you cannot maintain a Jewish majority state without it. You cannot run an occupation in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem and elsewhere 50 plus years without a deep belief which comes from a young age again i again i grew up in australia but the hatred and contempt that one is taught in mainstream jewish community life not everybody but many 
the only way you can maintain that system of racial oppression is with that education. That's the only way. That you do not see Palestinians as equal, that really it's a zero sum game. It's us or them. If they if they don't kill us, we have to kill them first. And the occupation relies on that perpetuation through, yes, military means, of course, but it's more than that. It's the way that Israeli mainstream society, as I've been saying for years now, Israeli society itself has been radicalized. I'm talking about Jewish society. Not every Israeli, of course, there are some who don't support this, but again, not my opinion, sizable proportions of the population, according to public opinion polls for years. I remember I have a quote in my book from 2016, that pretty much then half of Israeli Jews supported essentially forced ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. This was nearly 10 years ago. There's been polls since October 7, supporting a vast majority of Israeli Jews, supporting mass ethnic cleansing of Palestinians to God knows where, Jordan, Egypt, who knows? And this is why often, as I've also said for a long time, that the Western obsession with Netanyahu is misplaced. He's a terrible human being. He should be in the Hague. There's no sympathy for him. But it's misplaced to believe that somehow replacing him or if he falls as prime minister, the situation will change. He often says, frankly, correctly, you might not like me, but my policies are popular. He's absolutely correct. Now, there are obviously people in Israel who oppose what he stands for. Of course there are, since October 7 and before. But the majority of Israelis for months have wanted the war to continue. The likely replacements, Netanyahu, have very similar views to him on Jewish supremacy, keeping the occupation alive. The problem is not Netanyahu. He's a symptom of a much broader problem. And I think in some ways the last 10 months finally I think many people around the world have been clarifying because all of us have seen these insane TikTok videos of Israeli soldiers in Gaza uh, mocking Palestinians, torturing Palestinians, wearing, you know, Palestinian women's underwear, mock, you know, essentially that ritual humiliation. I think for a lot of people globally has been very clar clarifying and saying this is not simply a few bad apples in the military. Every military has got bad apples. This is symptomatic of a much deeper rot, which is because Israel has enjoyed impunity for so long, why would they stop? Why would they stop? Now, you could say because it's the right thing to do, and that's that's obviously true. But if you don't pay an economic price for your crimes, like apartheid South Africa did not do for most of its history until at the end, you won't change your behavior. And that's why without economic pain, Israel, in my view, will not change. Because the change won't come from within. Definitely. And I, I think something, I mean, we've seen this over the years, but something that's been very clear after, you know, from October 8th, is this campaign of dehumanizing Palestinians yes. to the where people are, you know, a lot of people aren't, but um, a lot of people are desensitized to to it. Um, you know, the mainstream media, we had a lot here of um, soon after October 7th of them pulling up pictures of Palestinian children. I think it was on one of the papers, but the, a huge picture of Palestinian children being killed under the title talking about Israelis um, being killed. So, you know, this kind of, um, there was so much of it, especially right after, you know, the first couple of months after mm. October 7th, it was constant, This the campaign of dehumanization. And now we're at a point where, you know, they were obviously manufacturing consent for the genocide, which Absolutely. is now 10 months, um, we're now 10 months into. And just talking about specifically, you know, after October 8th, you know, one of the things that the, um, the Elvis CEO said in the recent AGM in March was that for when they get contracts with other countries or the government in other countries, they want to know that it's first been used by the Israeli military. Is yes. there examples of um, either new weaponry or technologies or how are we seeing the kind of the, the Palestine laboratory of Gaza being played out um, as we speak? 
You mean since October 7? Yes. Yeah. Well, yes, the short answer is yes. So there's a few examples worth saying. One, there's been a number of global arms fairs that take place all the time, but there's been two major ones or three major ones in the last 10 months. Uh, Paris late last year, Singapore a few months ago in my part of the world and a few other ones in your country, UK. And there's been a lot of Israeli companies exhibiting at those places, literally talking about battle-tested weapons that have been used in Gaza. That's their words, not even mine. I'm not making this up. I mean, th this is where there is a appetite for that kind of technology. What has Israel been testing in Gaza? Well, a few things. Uh, a range of more sophisticated quadcopters, essentially, which are killer drones. Huge amounts of evidence of... Palestinians being killed in that way. There's examples of um, how best to describe this. Basically, drones putting out sounds of crying children in communities. People come out to look. They're thinking this is strange, not realizing it's a drone, and then and then, and then they get killed. There's been multiple eyewitness examples of this in Gaza in the last months. There has been huge amounts of use of white phosphorus, which obviously is not a new weapon, but white phosphorus is being used. There's use of robot dogs, which are being developed by both American and Israeli companies. There is, I mean, there's huge amounts of technology. There's also certain amounts of modifications to guns that the IDF soldiers are using in Gaza, which are being promoted globally at some of these global arms fairs. So there's a lot. I mean, there is a clear pattern and that's taken into the next level which is if one reads the Israeli business press which I do for my sins <laughs> for work you find that a lot of Israeli soldiers who have been operating in Gaza doing God knows what are raising money from both Israeli and foreign investors to build up companies to sell that to other countries and a lot of that money is more and more coming in from Silicon Valley in the US, who obviously are sympathetic to the cause. I'm not saying everybody there, but enough, huge amounts of money. And it's not, again, that is framed often in that support as you're doing a patriotic service. We are economically struggling a bit now because of the war. So the argument goes in Israel, come and support us financially invest in my company, whatever it may be. And again, I think there is a really ripe area here for putting pressure on those kinds of choke points. As civil society, as activists, as journalists, whatever we may be, because I think firstly, most people don't really know this is even going on, doesn't get nearly enough attention. And you know, I've seen, I guess we'll get to questions shortly, but, you know, how does this operate? How does, how, how you know, I mean, how does this potentially work? Well, a, a growing global movement of BDS. I mean, it's the, it is the only way. I think, I'm not saying it's the sole way, but it's the only way that there needs to be an economic price paid. I mean, there's examples of certain countries since October 7 pledging to not buy any more Israeli weapons. That needs to last including states like Colombia. Now, Colombia is run by a nominally left-wing government. It's not a major global power, of course, but I would want to make sure that states like that hold to their word because history would suggest that, not particularly Colombia, but many of these states do not. The issue dies down, people move on. There's a long history as one example between Israel and Colombia, just using that example. So, yes, I mean... Lots of weapons are being tested in Gaza. And finally, finally, the US, a number of US companies are also testing in Gaza too, as they are in Ukraine. These places are open testing grounds. And the US investment in Israel is partly a way to support the American worker building some of those weapons in the defense industry in the US. I mean, that's that dysfunctional relationship, right? That so much of the so-called aid money that is going to Israel from the US is partly to support the American, you know, certain seats held by Democrats or Republicans. And 
I wish I could say it would make a huge amount of difference who would win in November. I'm not suggesting Harris and Trump are the same. They're not. I think in many ways Trump is more dangerous. That's just my personal view. That's not going to American politics. But on this kind of issue, without massive pressure within the US and outside on, I would say the Democrats are more likely to be moved than the Republicans, this support will not change. So is it is it a fair assessment to say, you know, we've had companies like Elbit, like Raphael, the big the big dogs, the big Israeli weapons companies, mm. to using Gaza as a laboratory for so you know for, for for a very long time and developing their business on this, and now we're seeing other startups jumping on this kind of business model of using Gaza as a um as a laboratory, and also obviously. Um, you know, I could I could ask you questions all, all day. I know it's quite late for you that. So I'll try and bring this to a close and people please put in your questions. But you know, something we're seeing here as well is as activists who take direct action against Albert systems, um, throughout the years we have seen different techniques deployed against us uh, by the British state. And mm. we can confidently say that these techniques that are being used are done in an effort to protect the Israeli uh, weapons mm -hmm. trade. So, you know, as well as buying these weapons and allowing Elba to build these weapons, they're also, states are also willing to deploy very, you know, um, more increasingly repressive tactics against their own yes. citizens to yes. protect the trade of a foreign genocide Absolutely. entity. Um, so, you know, so the, the complicity runs deep, doesn't it? And I think, mm in the current situation i'm really glad we can have this conversation it's, it's important for the wider public who are on side of the palestinian people to understand those different connections because if we want yeah we want to fully you know stop these companies from being able to do this um and cut those links with zionism we need to understand what they are and how and how mm. they might in different ways I agree. I mean, I don't think the arms industry is the sole reason Israel is doing what it's doing, but it's a massive factor. I don't think Israel's in Gaza because of the arms industry. I don't think Israel's in the West Bank just because of the arms industry. They're not. But I do think, and I don't think I know because the evidence is overwhelming, that it's a key factor in potentially never wanting to end the occupation because it's massively profitable. Yeah. Again, obviously some people are in are settlers in the West Bank because they think God put them there. Okay, that's obviously ideological, and I'm not saying that's irrelevant. It's obviously very relevant as Israel becomes, I think, I feel on its current trajectory, Israel is moving towards becoming a theocratic state. I don't think it's inevitable. I mean, you could argue it's theocratic in some ways already now. But I mean, full-blown, I mean, its biggest supporters, their their vision is the Taliban, obviously Jewish, not Muslim. That's their vision. They want to live like the Taliban. Again, Jewish, not Muslim, of course. And that's not all Israelis, but the direction that country's going in, in my view, is more and more looking to be like that. And the arms industry and the defense sector and the high-tech sector, many of whom do not share those views, by the way, it's hard to generalize, but many times they do not, do increasingly view the defense sector as one way to patriotically support Israel and are willing to overlook the more, frankly, blatant ways that those tools are being used, I'm not just on Palestinians, but globally. I mean, I have this in the book, so many examples that I think if you often ask many Israelis, are you aware of where all these tools of repression are ending up? The answer is, well, it's a tough neighbourhood. We have to do what we have to do. Let's not ask too many questions. And again, obviously, other countries have arms industries. Your country does. The US does. France, Germany, Russia, China. Israel's not the only arms dealer in the world. Of course, that's true. But it's about 10th in the world, roughly. And it's never going to be number one. The US is number one by far. And Israel is roughly ninth or 10th. But for a country of 9, 10 million people, that's pretty astounding and i would argue that no other country on this planet has such a ready population palestinians 
who were tested on yeah. for decades. And I just want to say finally on this point that this is not really just a question of an arms industry to make money, as I keep on saying. Obviously, money is important. But it's not the only factor here. Israel, I think, is part of a key unofficial global coalition of ethno-nationalist states that are pushing a certain agenda, a certain worldview. The Israel-India relationship is a good example of that. Modi is doing what he's doing in India for his own reasons. He's not doing it because of Israel. He wants to create a Hindu fundamentalist state. Okay. But Israel and India are not just defense partners. They're ideological soulmates. And that's based on how many Indians view what Israel is doing to Palestinians and vice versa. And there's a growing number of states, including the far right in your country and my country and Europe, who are traditionally anti-Semitic and don't like Jews, who view Israel as a model. And we should ask serious questions about why that is and why many within Israel welcome those ties, because that's what's happening. And that's getting more overt, not less. Yeah, definitely, and especially in, in recent weeks in um, in England, as you said, they always like to fly the uh, Israeli flag as they... I mean, um... it's... Yeah. Um, yes. So I just want to quickly, so for those who are asking about what you can do about it, so we do our, our MO as Palestine Action is taking direct action against Elba Systems, and that includes a range of different types of actions with different levels of consequences. And to find out more about if you want to, you know, if, about different ways you can shut down Elbit and other Israeli weapons manufacturers, then I think someone will drop some links in the chat. We do have a training day which people can apply for, uh, which is in person. It runs through some of this background, but it also goes into legal consequences and other practical stuff and we have online workshops as well twice a week which cover a crash course on direct action and um, i talked i talked a bit about the repression that have been faced and i just want to remind everyone if you haven't heard about the filton 10 these are 10 people who have been arrested in the past two weeks and uh, they were first detained about charge under the terrorism act which was a complete abuse of power and a way that the state could basically interrogate them day after day and detain them without charge, only to then charge them with offences which are not uh, underneath the Terrorism Act, that charges like burglary and criminal damage. And um, we now have the Fulton 10 are in different prisons um, across England. There are now 11 Palestine Action political prisoners. And, um, you know, they did the... The six who were originally arrested managed to uh, break into the Filton based research hub, a new research hub, which was um, opened by the Israeli ambassador. And they um, allegedly caused over a million pounds worth of damage. And inside, they also damaged Israeli quadcopter drones, which we've talked about in this conversation. And so, in a bid to protect um, the arms trade, the state are, are, are trying to repress them, um, but also the state are showing their weakness more and more, um, and Elbert Systems are showing their weaknesses more and more, and that, you know, in order to shut them down as a movement, we will not back down to intimidation attempts and attempts to stop us from shutting down this company. We've already shut down several Elbert weapons factories, and we plan to shut them all down um, in within the near future, hopefully, with all of your help. There's also ways you can donate to the Legal Defence Fund as well. Um, I want to go into some of the questions from people. Hmm. So in terms of um, this practical, this, this will be recorded, and this is recorded, and we'll put it on our YouTube channel. Um, okay, so... I just saw someone say, what's the title of my recent book? It's called The Palestine Laboratory. You can Google it. It's everywhere. You should buy 20 copies each. I'll shut up. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so someone asked, I often hear a defense of Albert UK is that they mm -hmm. serve the national defense of the country. Um, so, so that's uh, the statement. And the question is, could you tell us how deep the connection between Albert and the UK military are? Do you, 
do you have general comments well on that? Yeah, I mean, unbelievably close. I mean, you have footage for years, long before October 7, of Elbert officials, uh, you know, appearing with government ministers. I mean, they're incredibly close. Israel is a huge purchaser of Elbert equipment, but in, obviously Elbert also sells to many states around the world. And it's also worth saying that what Israel is trying to do more and more since October 7 is to produce a lot more weapons within Israel itself. Obviously, they produce some already, but the vast bulk of weapons that Israel's using in Gaza is coming from, as I said, two countries, the US and Germany. And I think Israel is thinking that it's not going to happen anytime soon, frankly, but what happens if these other states start imposing embargoes on us or there is boycotts or there is somehow a pro-Palestine US president? Hard to imagine, but what happens if that happens? We need to be more self-sufficient. And therefore, Elbert is massively ramping up to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, contracts from the Israeli government, to produce a lot more equipment within Israel itself. But Elbert and the Israeli government have been close for decades. I said they've existed since the 60s. They regularly appear at global arms fairs. I've been to some of them myself as a observer and not a participant, just to be clear. And they're ubiquitous with Israel. I mean, they're Israel's biggest defense company. So, yeah, they're inseparable between Israel and the state in many ways. Thank you for that. Um, as the genocide uh, continues and increases, and in, I think, yeah, I mean, increases in pace, as the genocide increases in pace, are there any in the Israeli regime that are concerned about losing uh, the laboratory in which their exported defense systems are tested? Huh. I mean, the short answer is, there are a growing number of Israelis who are worried about being potentially arrested and charged. Now, one might say that seems quite far-fetched. I'm talking about either from the ICC, which at the moment is, as we are looking for arrest warrants for two Israeli leaders, and I think it's three Hamas leaders. I think I think it was actually Hania who's now been killed. So I guess two Hamas leaders and two Israeli leaders. But if you read the Israeli press, you find growing concerns that when this war is over, whatever that means, that a number of states will try to prosecute Israeli soldiers and generals and figures in their own countries for alleged war crimes. And a number of states have said that they would potentially do that, including South Africa. And, I mean, in some ways, the reason, as I keep saying, the laboratory is unlikely to end anytime soon is a, it's so profitable, and B, I think also, I didn't mention this before, but it's worth saying, I think the laboratory also, Israel feels like it gives it an insurance policy. And what I mean by that is that as there's a growing likelihood, this was happening before October 7, but certainly since, a growing likelihood of some form of sanctions, boycotts, divestments, not from everywhere, but from certain states, certain institutions, that... Israel has felt for years that selling weapons to so many countries will insulate it from economic pain. And so far, at least, that has been relatively true until this point. Yes, there's been obviously boycott, divestment, sanctions since 2005. It's had undoubted successes, some setbacks as well. But Economically, Israel has done relatively okay because of all the massive international support in the an arms industry, which is soaring, etc. And I think that could potentially change with appropriate global action and pressure, economic pressure and pain that Israel feels. And also I would say finally that, I mean, what the EU, which is Israel's biggest trading partner, could do overnight is to say anyone, for example, who lives in a, in a legal settlement, which is everyone in West Bank, would not be able to travel to Europe on visa-free travel. That might seem like a very small thing to do. But let me tell you, 
there are so many Israelis who love the idea of living a normal, you know, living normally, so-called normally. They want to go to the Greek islands for a summer holiday. If that suddenly becomes impossible, I guarantee you it changes things. It doesn't bring everything down, but it changes things. And I think there should be massive more pressure on your com- your government and others. The UK government, I know, has imposed sanctions. I think it's on five or six people, which I welcome. But that is, you know, it's almost like going is in extreme settlers. And I've got no problem with that. I welcome it. But that's obviously missing the point. The point is the Israeli government. <laughs> These settlers don't operate independently. They work with the Israeli state. Um, so until you start boycotting or sanctioning government ministers, which I think is necessary mm-hmm. last week, let alone tomorrow, then I think things will start changing. I really do. Economic pain is what this is about. It's like that's what ended South Africa. There was lots of reasons, but in the end, South Africa was really given a choice globally that you either change or you're going to become a massive pariah. And that was economic pain, cultural isolation, to be sure. But economic pain was a huge factor. And that change was not going to come from the white population. Obviously, it came from the black population. But the white population, with some exceptions, of course, there were some whites who opposed apartheid, absolutely. But the vast majority did not. It was very comfortable for them. And Israel exactly the same. The vast majority of Israelis support it. Or don't do anything against it. Put it that way. Um, another question is about um, America openly announces Israel as as um, as their greatest ally, and one of the many platforms of international organizations is the United Nations. Mm. And we know that you know the US has been vetoing for Israel from for you know for decades. Um, yeah. The act is removing America from UN a solution to preventing this complex military industry. And also, actually, I want to, we haven't I haven't checked on this in you know in the past year or so, but a couple of years ago we did find that there was a contract with the UN for Elbit Hermes 900 drones, I believe, for peacekeeping missions. So I've again, got some of stuff in my book, yeah. yeah. I mean, the UN, yeah. the UN has made deals with lots of Israeli companies, defense companies, yeah. So there's Go that situation which isn't really discussed a lot, is it? I mean, in terms of, you know, they're also benefiting from the Palestine laboratory. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, do you want yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, the quick... Um, I mean, I... <laughs> I guess my answer to that is a bit roundabout, which is essentially saying that I've long been disappointed with how few non-Western states have really tried to isolate Israel. Of course, there are some who do. I mean, let's look at the Arab world, for example. I mean, as we know, I'm not talking about Arab people. I'm talking about Arab leadership, so-called leadership. Find me an Arab state that is seriously, I mean, not one Arab country has cut ties with Israel since October 7, not one. And I'm telling you they won't, not one. I'm not talking about Arabs protesting. They're talking about Arab leaders, not one. Why? Well, because they want to be close to the US. They like being friends with Israel. They want to get, I mean, as I talk about in the book, in the last five or so years, five, 10 years, all the, a lot of the Arab states have got huge amounts of Israeli surveillance tech and repressive uh, technology. They want, to, they want to get the experience of Israel surveilling Palestinians and use that to repress their own people in Saudi, Oman, Bahrain, Mm -hmm. Jordan, Egypt, the list goes on, Morocco. Um, And I'm not saying that there aren't Arabs in those countries who are protesting. They are in obviously very, very, very difficult circumstances. I'm under no illusion about that at all. Um, But I've long thought that there are many other states within the UN system that could do far more. What country always comes to mind is Indonesia. Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country in the world. It's a neighbour of me here in Australia. Ridiculously weak on this, in my view. Ridiculously weak. I'm not saying they support Israel, but where is that attempt to try to build that global momentum to, mm. to isolate Israel? I don't see it. Also, with the recent change in Brazil, um, I, I don't know if you have any comments on that because obviously there's been recent changes. Did you say Brazil, did you say? Brazil? Brazil. Brazil, Brazil yeah, yeah. 
the recent changes politically, um, but obviously they are still buying and hosting Albert systems. There have been people there protesting against that over there, but yeah, the actions aren't really matching the, the words, are they? It's difficult. I mean, obviously, as someone who's written about this for, you know, 20 years, I don't think that there's one protest and suddenly these issues change. <laughs> well, you know, movements take time, right? I know that. But if there's not going to be a growing and sustained global movement after the last 10 months, there never will be. I mean, how much worse does it need to get in Palestine? I mean, it cannot get, as I've been saying for months now, what's happening now is worse than 1948. I mean, we are on a whole different scale of horrors to me. I mean, there's just no, this is not even a comparison. I mean, 48 obviously was horrific, of course, but in any assessment, what's happening now is far worse, far more displacement, far more death. I mean, just horrific. And we have now the ability through technology and global connections in a way to, to build those alliances more so to try to put pressure on these companies in various countries because they what they crave is legitimacy. That's what they crave, publicly or privately. And too often our leaders give it to them. Yeah. In the global south too, as I said, this is not just an issue in the US, UK, Australia, France, Germany, which are all terrible as we know. As I document in the book, this is often happening in many other countries in the global south too that have partnered with Israel maybe more quietly sometimes, mm -hmm. um, including the ones you mentioned, Brazil, Colombia, and others. Uh, I mean, this is an example briefly. Mexico in the last five years has on paper had a left-wing government. Mm -hmm. They're still using Pegasus obsessively. I mean, you know, ultimately left-wing, right-wing, I'm not saying left-wing and right-wing is the same thing. I'm well aware they're very different. But in terms of these issues, there is often bipartisanship, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, there's another question here, which I think circles back to what I was saying about Albert's UK propaganda. Um, they asked how close are Albert UK and Albert HQ in Israel? Um, are the companies grouped together and share profit or are they kept separate? If a financial hit is experienced in the UK, part, it is part of that felt in Albert Israel. So just mm -hmm. to practically answer, Albert UK is completely owned by... Albert Israel. So they are subsidiaries of one another, but essentially they're all part of the same Albert group. And they openly say that and brag about it in Israel. But over here, suddenly there's a very important distinction. Yes. Um, could you maybe comment about um, the, ec the, the economics of it, about how and uh, about how integral maybe Albert's global business is to maintaining their Palestine laboratory and their business overall? Well, it's hugely because, um, I mean, putting the UK aside just for a second, I mean, Albert, as I said, is Israel's biggest defence company. It's hugely selling globally to countless countries. It's to, I mean, this is an example. A few months ago, there was a massive arms fair in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Albert was unveiling a huge new drone technology, which obviously is going to be used potentially in Gaza, over Gaza, but also by various other states. And they were, they were trying to promote that to global clients who would attend such an arms fair, whether it's Singapore or um, a lot of Asian states increasingly are purchasing Israeli technology, talking about Cambodia, Vietnam, et cetera, India. And so, look, you know, targeting Elbert, considering its central position, is wholly legitimate and necessary because it's, it's Israel's biggest defense company. So that by definition means it's a target. And it's it's actively complicit in genocide because it actually, I mean, it's promoting its use in Gaza. It's not even doing, it's not a secret. I mean, they, they, they're promoting it, right? We don't know every single intimate detail, but they're promoting it in general. Yeah, 100%. So someone asked here about if an activist is taken to court, can you argue that Elbit Raphael and other arms companies supporting Israel is actually supporting terrorism in light of all of the evidence. Mm. Um, so what's, what's your immediate thoughts on that? I mean, I, I well, as a non-lawyer, I would like to think the answer to that would be yes. But I, I mean, I guess I would, 
uh, defer to a, a, I guess, a lawyer in the UK about that. But yeah, I mean, what Israel has been doing for decades in the occupation is clearly terrorism under any definition. Yeah. Can they be argued in a court of law? That I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we try and argue, they make it increasingly difficult, is that um, you it, in English law, if you um, if you do something which may be seen as illegal, it's not illegal if you're doing to prevent a greater crime. So we would argue that all of our actions, all of our diet action is lawful because we're upholding international law. Mm. Um, which Albert is breaking and we're acting to save lives, which is a defense in English law. How easy they make to argue that is dependent on which courtroom you get, which jury yes. you get. And the legal system has increasingly done what it can to make it more difficult to make these points mm. um, in order to ultimately protect the weapons industry. Mm. Um, there was a historically an example of um, Raytheon in Derry in Ireland. It's very pro Palestine place. And they basically, some men went in and they destroyed this factory, this Raytheon factory. Um, it was during the bombing of Lebanon and they went to court and they argued this necessity. They were acting to save lives and they were found not guilty. And then nine women did a similar action and they were found not guilty. And obviously then the factory left after that, they shut up, they shut, they shut down. And it was pretty stupid to be in Derry in the first place, to be honest, but yeah, they don't normally think about these things. Um, but I think part of it was that they didn't have the legal protection or that there was no nothing stopping people from doing it because in the eyes of the law, you're being found not guilty, what you're doing is is lawful. So there's obviously an attempt mm -hmm. to try and create more of a deterrence against us over here. But I think what motivates us what motivates us to keep going is um is the genocide and Albert's actions and um com you know the comparison of of uh, of what the consequences are of these weapons to the people in Gaza, mm. this weapons industry. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, and to countless other countries around the world that have suffered under Elbert yes. technology too. Yeah, definitely. I mean one of the um one of the things you talked about was Germany. We have actually since October eighth, uh, six October seventh, we've had numerous different Palestine action groups launch across Europe. Um, we have now a group in Germany, which is very exciting, who, because there is Elbit in Germany and other, other arms companies, but as you said, they're quite key to the efforts of the, to, to arming yes. the genocide. Um, we do have actually an event on that later today to hear from people in Italy, uh, Netherlands, Austria, Germany, France, and other places now who are taking mm. that action. So the you know the, the using the tactic of direct action, I think, has never become more um, necessary. But also, you know, for people, you see what's going on. You see the the reluctance and the governments, global governments, not imposing mm. sanctions and continuing. Mm. Well, the opposite, it. in fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so the option mm. you're left with is often um, direct action. I could keep asking you questions. Honestly, I could be here. We could be here all day. And it's not, it's quite early for us, but I know it's late. Where it is quite are. late. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's okay. Um, just going to, is there, is there anything else you would like to, I think we can, we can end on those points. We could um, I mean, like that. Nothing. No, look, as you say, there's obviously so much more to say, but I think overall, you know, to me, I think I would really hope that the momentum that has built in the last 10 months in the most horrific circumstances in the UK and elsewhere around, when I say Palestine action, I don't just mean your group, but, you know, the whole issue around Palestine and awareness of it has to continue because to sustain something and get and get some kind of political response will take time because the forces arrayed against it, something I've written about a lot, we didn't talk about this particularly tonight, but the forces arrayed against it are huge. We all know that. 
And there is a lot invested in maintaining that status quo, hugely. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be beaten. I don't say that at all. But it's it, And there's also, I think, a growing awareness within Israel and Israel's supporters globally, which I read about regularly, that there is, as you could say, they're losing the PR battle. I mean, you kind of wonder why that would be the case after 10 months of genocide in Gaza. But nonetheless, there's an awareness of that. And I think there'll be more and more attempts to use lawfare against legitimate actions and criticisms of Israel in Western states. And we can't we aren't going to tolerate politicians doing that bidding. I'm talking about politicians in your country or mine or any other country, really. And I think without regular I mean without regularly exposing how many, for example, UK politicians in the Labour Party have been to Israel on free lobby trips in the last five years, uh, which explains so much about all these issues. I honestly think it does. I don't think it explains everything, but it explains a lot. So, yeah, my feeling would be, yeah, what else would I say? That spread this information, I'm not just saying what I say, but spread this information as widely as possible because I think a lot of people, I've found this since my book came out, 15, 16 months ago, that so many people was not were not aware of those connections about how to explain where we're, how we're in this moment, particularly in relation to Gaza, but more broadly, of the global arms industry is worth over $2 trillion a year. It's arguably the most corrupt industry in the world. People often say that's either the most corrupt or the global drug trade. Take your pick. They both you know, industries of death and it deserves to be ended and challenged in a variety of ways. So I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Barks, thank you so much, Anthony. Please yeah. let us know in England and we'll take you on a yes. tour. A bit. Yes. I'd, inshallah, that'd be great. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you everyone for uh, listening. Yes, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's links in the chat to all the different things we talked about, about how to get more involved and support in different ways. Um, thank you. I'll end it, end it like that. Thank you. Bye-bye.